Hello guys, well, I am here for chapter 12. Hope you are enjoying Hoot so far. Chapter 12. Roy was exhausted. It seemed like a hundred years ago that Dana Matherson had tried to strangle him inside the janitor's closet. But it had happened only that afternoon. Thanks, now we're even, Beatrice Leap said. Maybe, said Roy. They were waiting in the emergency room of the Coconut Cove Medical Center which was more of a large clinic than a hospital. It was here they'd brought Beatrice's stepbrother after carrying him upright for almost a mile, each of them bracing one of his shoulders. He's going to be all right, Roy said. For a moment, he thought Beatrice was about to cry. He reached over and squeezed her hand, which, she noticed, which was noticeably larger than his own. He's a tough little cockroach, Beatrice said with a sniffle. He'll be okay. A woman dressed in baby blue scrubs and wearing a stethoscope approached them. She introduced herself as Dr. Gonzalez. Tell me exactly what happened to Roy, she said. Beatrice and the real Roy exchanged anxious glances. Her stepbrother had forbidden them from giving his name to the hospital for fear that his mother would be notified. The boy got so agitated that Roy hadn't argued. When the emergency room clerk asked Beatrice for her stepbrother's name, address, and phone number, Roy impulsively had stepped forward and blurted his own. It seemed like the quickest way to get mullet fingers into a hospital bed. Roy knew he was also getting himself in trouble. Beatrice Leap knew it too. That's why she had thanked him. My brother got bit by a dog, she told Dr. Gonzalez. Several, Roy added. What kind of dogs? The doctor asked. Big ones. How did it happen? Here Roy let Beatrice take over the story as she was more experienced at fibbing to adults. They nailed him at soccer practice, she said. He came running home all chewed up, so we brought him here as fast as we could. Hmm, said Dr. Gonzalez with a slight frown. What? Don't you believe me? <clears throat> Beatrice's indignation sounded genuine. Roy was impressed. But the doctor was a cool one, too. Oh, I believe your stepbrother was attacked by dogs, she said. I just don't believe it happened today. Beatrice stiffened. Roy knew he had to come up with something fast. The wounds on his arm aren't fresh, Dr. Gonzalez explained. Judging by how far the infection has progressed, I'd estimate he was bitten 18 to 24 hours ago. Beatrice looked flustered. Roy didn't wait for her to recover. Yeah, 18 hours. That sounds about right, he said to the doctor. I don't understand. See, he passed out right after he got bit, Roy said. It wasn't until the next day he finally woke up, and that's when he came running home. Then Beatrice called me and asked me if I'd get him to the hospital. Dr. Gonzalez fixed Roy with a stern gaze, though there was an edge of amusement in her voice. What's your name, son? Roy gulped. She caught him off guard. Tex. He answered, weakly. Beatrice nudged him with her elbow as if to say, That's the best you can do? The doctor crossed her arms. So, Tex, let's get this straight. Your friend Roy is mauled at the soccer field by several huge dogs. Nobody tries to help him, and he remains unconscious all night and most of the next day. All of a sudden, he wakes up and jogs home. Is that right? Yep. Roy bowed his head. He was a pathetic liar, and he knew it. Dr. Gonzalez turned her ste steely attention to Beatrice. Why was it left for you to bring your stepbrother here? Where are your parents? Working, Beatrice replied. Didn't you call them and tell them there was a medical emergency? Their crew on a crab boat, no phone. Not bad, Roy thought. The doctor, however, wasn't buying it. It's hard to understand, she said to Beatrice, how your stepbrother could go missing for so long and nobody in the family got concerned enough to call the police. Sometimes he runs away from home, Beatrice said, and he doesn't come back for a while. It was the closest thing to a true answer that she'd given, and ironically, it was the one that made Dr. Gonzalez back off. I'm going to check on Roy now, she told them. In the meantime, you two might want to polish up your story. How's he doing anyways, Beatrice asked. Better. He got a tetanus shot, and now we're loading him with antibiotics and pain medication. It's strong stuff, so he's pretty sleepy. 
Can we see him? Not right now. As soon as the doctor had gone, Roy and Beatrice hurried outside where it was safer to talk. Roy sat down on the steps of the emergency room. Beatrice remained standing. This isn't going to work, cowgirl. Once they figure out he's not you, it's a problem, Roy agreed. The understatement of the year. And if Lana hears about this, you know he'll end up in juvie detention, Beatrice said gloomily, until she finds a new military school. Probably someplace far off like Guam where he can't run away. Roy didn't understand how a mother could kick her own child out of her life, but he knew such tragic things occurred. He heard of fathers who acted the same way. It was depressing to think about. We'll come up with something, he promised Beatrice. Know what, Tex? You're okay. She pinched his cheek and went bounding down the steps. Hey, where are you going? He called after her. Fixing dinner for my dad. I do it every night. You're kidding, right? You're not really leaving me here all alone. Sorry, Beatrice said. Dad'll freak if I don't show up. He can't make toast without burning off his fingertips. Couldn't Lana cook his dinner this one time? Nope. She tends bar at the Elks Lodge. Beatrice gave Roy a brisk little wave. I'll be back as soon as I can. Don't let him operate or nothing on my brother. Wait! Roy jumped to his feet. Tell me his real name. It's the least you can do after everything that's happened. Sorry, cowgirl, but I can't. I made him a blood promise a long time ago. Please. If he wants you to know, Beatrice said, he'll tell you himself. Then she ran off, her footsteps fading into the night. Roy trudged back into the emergency room. He knew his mother would be getting worse, so she asked the desk clerk if he could borrow the phone. It ran a ha rang a half dozen times on the other end before Eberhardt's answering machine picked up. Roy left a message saying he'd be home as soon as he and Beatrice finished cleaning up the mess from the science project. Alone in the waiting area, Roy dug through a stack of magazines until he found an issue of the outdoor life that had an article about fishing for cutthroat trout in the Rocky Mountains. The best thing about the story was the photograph. Anglers wading knee-deep in blue western rivers lined with tall cottonwoods, rows of snowy mountain crags visible in the distance. Roy was feeling pretty homesick for Montana when he heard the approach of a siren outside. He decided it was an excellent time to go and find a Coke machine, even though he only had two dimes in his pocket. The truth was, Roy didn't want to be in the emergency room to see what that siren was all about. He wasn't prepared to see them wheel in somebody who'd been injured in a serious wreck, somebody who might even be dying. Other kids could be really curious about that gory stuff, but not Roy. Once when he was seven years old and his family lived near Milwaukee, a drunken hunter drove a snowmobile full speed into an old birch tree. The accident happened only a few yards from a slope where Roy and his father were sledding. Mr. Eberhardt had run up the hill to try to help, with Roy huffing close behind. When they'd reached the tree, they realized there was nothing they could do. Dead man was soaked in blood and twisted at odd angles like a broken G.I. Joe doll. Roy knew he would never forget what he saw and he never wanted to see anything like it again. Consequently, he had no intention of hanging around the emergency room for the arrival of a new emergency. He slipped through a slide door and wandered through the hospital for about 15 minutes until a nurse intercepted him. I think I'm lost, Roy said, doing his best to appear confused. You most definitely are. The nurse steered him down a back corridor to the emergency room where Roy was relieved to find no chaos or carnage. The place was as quiet as he'd left it. Puzzled, Roy went to the window to check outside. There was no ambulance in the delivery zone, only a Coconut Cove police cruiser. Maybe it was nothing, he thought, and he returned to his magazine. Soon after, Roy heard voices from behind the double doors that led to an area where mullet fingers was being treated. A loud discussion was taking place in the patient ward, and Roy strained to make out what was being said. One voice in particular rose above the rest, and Roy was distressed to recognize it. He sat there in nervous misery, trying to decide what to do next. Then he heard another familiar voice, and he knew there was only one choice. 
He walked to the double doors and pushed them open. Hey, Mom, Dad, he shouted. I'm right here. Officer Delinko had insisted on giving the Eberhards a ride to the hospital. It was a decent thing to do, and also a prime opportunity to score points with Roy's father. The patrolman hoped that Mr. Eberhardt's son wasn't involved in continuing mischief at the Pancake House construction site. What a sticky situation that would be. On the drive to the hospital, Roy's parents sat in the back seat and spoke quietly between themselves. His mother said that she couldn't imagine how Roy had gotten bitten by a dog while he was working on a science project. Maybe it had something to do with all that hamburger meat, she speculated. Hamburger, said Roy's father. What kind of school project uses hamburger? In the rearview mirror, Officer Delinko could see Mr. Eberhardt put her arm around his wife's shoulders. Her eyes were moist and she was biting her lower lip. Mr. Eberhardt appeared as tightly wound as a clock spring. When they got to the emergency room, the desk clerk declared that Roy was sleeping and couldn't be disturbed. The Eberhards tried to reason with him, but the clerks wouldn't budge. We're his parents, Mr. Eberhardt said evenly, and we intend to see him right away. Sir, don't make me call a supervisor. I don't care if you call the Wizard of Oz, said Mr. Eberhardt. We're going in. The clerk trailed them through the swinging double doors. You can't do this, he objected, scooting ahead of the Eberhards and blocking the hallway to the patient ward. Officer Delinko edged forward, assuming that the sight of the police uniform would soften the fellow's attitude. He was mistaken. Absolutely no visitors. It says right here on the doctor's notes. The clerk solemnly waved at clipboard. I'm afraid you'll have to go back to the waiting room. That means you too, officer. Officer Delinko shrank away. Not the Everhearts. Listen, that's our son laying in there, Roy's mother reminded the clerk. You called us, remember? You told us to come. Yes, and you may see Roy as soon as the doctor says it's allowed. Then page the doctor, now. Mr. Everhart's tone of voice remained level, but the volume had gotten much louder. Pick up the phone and dial. If you've forgotten how, we'll be happy to show you. The doctor's on break. She'll be back in 25 minutes, the clerk said tersely. Then she can find us right here, Mr. Everhart said, visiting our injured son. Now, if you don't move out of the way, I'm going to drop kick you all the way to Chocola C. Understand? The clerk went pale. I'm reporting you to my supervisor. That's a dandy idea. Mr. Eberhardt brushed past and started down the hall, guiding his wife by the elbow. Hold it right there, snapped a firm female voice behind them. The Eberhardt stopped and turned. Emerging from a door marked staff only was a woman wearing baby blue scrubs and a stethoscope. I'm Dr. Gonzalez. Where do you think you're going? To see our son, replied Miss Everhart. <coughs> I tried to stop them, the desk clerk piped up. You're Roy's parents, the doctor asked the Everharts. We are, Roy's father noticed Dr. Gonzalez eyeing them with odd curiosity. Pardon me if this is out of line, she said, but you sure don't look like you work on a crab boat. What on earth are you talking about? Roy's mother said. Is everybody at this hospital a total wacko? There must be some mistake, Officer Delenko interjected. Mr. Eberhardt is a federal law enforcement agent, Dr. Gonzalez sighed. We'll sort this out later. Come on, let's go peek in on your boy. The emergency patient ward had six beds, five of, which, five of which were unoccupied. The sixth bed had a white privacy curtain drawn around it. We've got him on IV antibiotics and he's doing pretty well, Dr. Gonzalez said in a low voice. But unless we find those dogs, we'll need a series of rabies injections, and those are no fun. The Eberhards locked arms as they approached the enclosed bed. Officer Delenko stood behind them, wondering what color shirt Roy would be wearing. In the patrolman's pocket was the bright green scrap of clothing that had snagged on the Mother Paula's fence. Don't be surprised if he's sleeping, the doctor whispered gently, pulling the curtain away. Nobody said a word for several moments. The four grown-ups just stood there, blank-faced, 
staring at the empty bed. From a metal rig hung a plastic bag of ginger-colored fluid. The intravenous tube disconnected and dangling on the floor. Finally, Mr. Eber Mrs. Eberhardt gasped. Where's Roy? Dr. Gonzalez's arms flapped helplessly. I just, I really, I don't know. You don't know? Mr. Eberhardt erupted. One minute an injured boy is asleep in this bed and the next minute he's vanished? Officer Delenko stepped between Mr. Eberhardt and the doctor. The patrolman was afraid that Roy's father was upset to do something he might regret later. Where is our son? Mrs. Eberhardt demanded again. The doctor buzzed for a nurse and frantically started searching the emergency ward. But he was the only patient here, Mr. Eberhardt said angrily. How can you lose the one and only patient you've got? What happened? Did aliens beam him up to our spaceship while you were on your coffee break? Roy, Roy, where are you? cried Mrs. Eberhardt. She and Dr. Gonzalez began checking beneath the other five beds in the ward. Officer Delinka whipped out his portable radio and said, I'm calling for backup. Just then, the double doors to the waiting room flew open. Dad, Mom, I'm right here. The Eberhardt practically, Eberhardts practically smothered their son with a tandem hug. Little devil, juggled Officer Delinko, holstering his radio. He was pleased to see that Roy wasn't wearing a torn green t-shirt. Whoa, Dr. Gonzalez clapped her hand sharply. Everybody hold on a minute. The Eberhards looked quizzically. The doctor didn't seem especially overjoyed to have found her lost patient. That's Roy, she asked, pointing at their son. Of course it is. Who else would it be? Mrs. Eberhardt kissed the top of his head. Honey, you get back into that hospital bed right now. Not so fast, Mr. Eberhardt said. I'm not sure what's going on here, but I've got a feeling we owe the doctor an apology. Probably several apologies. He planted both hands on Roy's shoulders. Let's see those dog bites, partner. Roy lowered his eyes. I didn't get bit, Dad. It wasn't me. Mrs. Everhart groaned. Okay, now I get it. I'm the crazy one, right? I'm the raving loony bird. Folks, excuse me, but we've still got a major problem, Dr. Gonzalez said. We've still got a, miss a patient missing. Officer Delenko was thoroughly confused. Once again, he reached, reached for his radio in anticipation of calling headquarters. Before my brain explodes, says Mrs. Everhart, would somebody please explain what this is all about? Only one person can do that, Mr. Everhart gestured towards Roy, who suddenly wanted to crawl down a hole and hide. His father turned him around to face Dr. Gonzalez. Tex, she said, arching an eyebrow. Roy felt his face redden. I'm really sorry. This is a hospital. This is no place for games. I know it's not. I apologize. If you're the real Roy, the doctor said, then who was the young man in the bed and where did he go? I want the truth. Roy stared at the tops of his sneakers. He couldn't remember another day in his life when so many things had gone so wrong. Son, his father said, answer the doctor. His mother squeezed his arm. Come on, honey, it's important. We can be, sh you can be sure we'll find him, Officer Delenko chimed in, sooner or later. Leakly, Roy looked up to address the grown-ups. I don't know the boy's name. I don't know where he is, he said. I'm sorry, but that's the truth. And technically, it was.